Well, this morning, we are going to be starting what you've heard as life groups, and the life groups are going to be built around the sermons that are, are preached on Sunday morning. So the simple thing is, if you've never been to a small group, if you've never been to a Bible study, if you've never been to any of those things, that's, that's okay because this isn't quite like a small group or a Bible study anyway. These are just going to be little groups that are gathering together, and they're called life groups because the purpose is to share life. But we're using as a springboard, we're going to be using uh, these sermons, and we're going to be looking from Romans uh, for each of these sermons. So this week we're looking at Romans chapter 1 and 2. Next week we'll be looking at Romans 3 and 4, etc., etc. And so that way when we're not gathering around and looking at each other and go, so how's the weather? What about those Blue Jays? And are the Patriots going to win? Which they are. Um, the, um, you actually get to have... Uh, something of substance, hopefully, you at least have the Word of God there to help spur on a little bit of conversation. As you can see on the back of the insert that you have on life groups, the questions are not um, rocket science questions. They're simply about sharing your life and, and different things that you've learned. Hopefully they'll make more sense after the preaching of the sermon today. Uh, but just to encourage you right now, if you go, oh no, I'm not the type of person that goes to Bible studies, or oh no, I'm, I, I, I can't commit to that. This is an eight-week series that you can pop in and pop out of. If you only, only can make one or two, fine. Make what you can. And um, again, you're not going to be behind because it's just from the sermon you just saw. And if there is a Sunday that you're not able to make it out, because I know we have many that are on shift work and course, etc., all the sermons are going to be online, so some of you are probably actually watching the sermon now over your computer. Um, so you can just pop that on, watch it, and then uh, go to your group, and you're just as equipped as anybody else to attend your group. But this morning we're going to start in Romans in chapter 1 and 2, and uh, we're going to be looking at the scripture um, throughout the message this morning. I printed some of it in your bulletin, but I want to start off by saying this. Some of the best stories that are ever told, and not stories as in fantasy, but the non-fiction, the true life stories, some of the best stories that are told actually start quite dark. Did you know that? They don't start off with, happily ever after, we da-da-da-da-da. No. Most of the stories that really impact lives start off quite dark. There's a there's either a realization or more oftentimes there's a situation, whatever the case, the stories begin in, um, in an area where there needs to be significant change and something or someone shows up and, and helps move the characters forward. So this morning when we're looking at Romans chapters 1 and 2, the key word that I think of and I think it's important for all of us to know is the word lost. There was a huge um, TV series on this uh, show called Lost. I'll be honest, I never watched a single episode of it. But it seemed to capture all kinds of people's attention. Um, but that's, we're not talking about uh, a TV series. We're talking about the state of lost. And back quite a few years ago, there was a, an incident that happened um, in Chile. And there was 33 miners that were trapped underground. How many of you remember that? I mean, oh, everyone was watching it. it was on, everyone was listening for the updates. They were trying to drill through, and it wouldn't make it through this one, and it wouldn't make it through that one. It was a race against time, and they're running out of food, and they're running out of air. But they knew that they existed down there. But how could they get to them? And this was a story, a wonderful redemption story we know at the end of it, where all 33 of them were able to, to get back to the surface and, and be restored. And actually, if you were part of the Alpha group or you're going to look to take Alpha at some time in the future, you'll hear uh, at least one of those miners share their story about what that was like and, and, and how um, their faith interacted with this uh, experience. But it's not just this story. If you look through the scriptures, if you open your eyes to look at the scriptures as being more than just a textbook, but you see it as compilations of stories where God interacted and changed lives, you're going to see this theme over and over and over again. Joseph and the beautiful 
um, coat of many colors, who was the privileged child who got thrown into a cistern by his brothers. And I never understood that until I had kids, because I was an only child. I can see how that could happen. <laughs> and then uh, how his path went to being a slave, and then to raising up to power, and then being knocked back down again, and being in prison, and and this up and down and up and down where it was dark and then it was looking hopeful and then it was dark again. The entire Passover, you know, where, where we celebrate where Moses parted the Red Sea and went through, but we forget the hundreds of years of captivity and the darkness that the people were in before. We, we celebrate um, the defeat of Goliath, but we forget about how huge the Philistine army was and what a threat it was to the people. We sometimes remember the ending of stories, but we forget how dire the beginning is. And even with the story of the life of Christ, we celebrate Christmas and we gloss over that Herod sent out a decree that all the male babies were killed in the area trying to wipe it out. We celebrate Easter and Christ resurrecting from the dead and we sometimes don't remember as powerfully Good Friday and the death on the cross and the darkness that fell over the land. What I'd like to today is I'd like to share the story of Romans. But in order to share the story of Romans, we need to paint the proper background. I've mentioned this guy before, Bob Ross. He was a guy that painted on MPBN or American PBS stations. And... Uh, uh, he's a classic. And what he would do is he would, you would sit and you would, somebody who doesn't enjoy painting, and you'd sit and you'd just listen to him because he has this mesmerizing voice. And it's just a, wow. And you're just lulled into this trance by him. And as he's flicking colors on the paper, you go, oh, he made a mess. And then he's able to twist and turn, and it's like it becomes a beautiful tree. The favorite one that I heard was where he would throw a plop of orange onto a canvas and go, now, Let's deal with this happy little mistake and makes the most beautiful sunset out of it. But one of the things I noticed with all of Bob Ross's paintings is that the ones that were the most dramatic were the ones where he had a black background, where he had a very dark background, and then the colors popped. As I go through today, I want you to recognize that this morning's message is going to sound a lot like a black background but it's in order to make the colors pop. In order for us to celebrate the fullness and the beauty of the gospel, we need to recognize the dark background on which it came to be. You got that? Okay. So with that lifter upper, I want to uh, show you this, that oftentimes the best stories start dire, and that's what makes it miraculous. The miracle of the believer's life is what is shown in the book of Romans, okay? The miracle of the believer's life is what is shown in the book of Romans. And you see a huge dramatic shift. As I said before, we often focus on the new, and we try and forget completely about the old. But if we forget the old or where we've come from, then we don't understand the fullness of the miracle. If you think you're a good person and God just came to make you a little bit better, you don't fully understand the gospel. You got that? So, let's dig in. The first thing we see is in um, Romans chapter 1. There's lots in Romans, and it's hard to pick through when you're taking two chapters of one of the, one of the most intensely written books of the Bible. It's hard to pick through what to do, but here's what we've come up with. First of all, God is obvious. This is a story of God and humanity, and God is spirit. He is not physically visible, but it does not mean that he is hiding. In fact, in the Gospels, Jesus describes God as being spirit, like the wind, where the wind blows and, and everyone sees the actions of the wind, but no one actually sees the wind. You ever notice that? You have to look to the trees or to the grass or to what's being blown in the wind to know that it's windy. You can't see the wind but it's not saying that the wind isn't real. The wind is extremely powerful. If we have anybody that's worked in the Air Force, especially they can explain that uh, to you far better than I can, or our meteorologists. But even though 
God is not physically visible, he is still obvious. Verse, uh, this is all, when you see verses 1 and 20 or 2 and 14 or whatever it is, these are all right out of Romans, okay? So this is where we're dealing from. So Romans 1.20 says this, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what he has made, so that we are without excuse. The creation of God screams creator. Screams out loud there is a creator. The design demands a designer. You cannot look at the intricacies of DNA. You cannot look at the intricacies of the, the various uh, creations of God and go, huh, that was so random. It is obvious that these things are created. And not only that, we knew him. And this is for people that didn't grow up, even in this passage, not necessarily Jews. These are people that um, did not know God the way um, we in a church gathering together understand that we know God. This is what we see in verse 21. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. When we look at the consistency of God's creation, we recognize that there is a truth that exists. There is an order. There is, uh, there is a designer. Someone has caused these things. We don't go and when uh, two chickens go off together and uh, one of the chickens lays an egg later, we're not going, I wonder if that's going to be a dinosaur. Oh, I hope it's a fir tree. Like, we know what's going to come. If we go and, and, we, and we put our foot on the ground and we hit some ice, we go, uh-oh, because we know gravity is going to be there and it's not going to be our friend. We don't go, oh, I wonder where this is going to end. We know where it's going to go. And the laws and the ways that God has created things gives us a consistency so that we can live lives that have consistency and not chaos. We can actually build ships, huge ships, because we understand how buoyancy works, how one of God's laws has created buoyancy. We're able to know when we can plant crops because it's not like, oh, I wonder if tomorrow's going to be summer or not. Like we're able to design our lives around the design of God, what God has done in his creation. And even with all of those things, all of those evidences, we often say, well, there is no God. This is random. They're, we're just really, really lucky. If you talk to the most brilliant scientist that does not believe in God, even the most brilliant scientist will sound childish. Well, you know, there's things that, th this is a quote, right? There are things that look like they're designed, but you have to be aware they aren't. And you look and you go, how much education do you have? Right? Simple farmers understand this. But no, no, this is what happens. Since we do not honor God, no, there can't be a God. And we can't thank God. Since that's the case, we become futile in our speculations. Oh, we think aliens came and planted the life forms here. Or, you know, this is really random. You know, so this will change. And their foolish heart was darkened because our minds, we were futile in our thinking, and what we think goes into our hearts. And so a darkened mind leads to a darkened heart. That's where it starts. And then it goes on and tells us this. We also know his truth. And these are people, uh, this is what the description that we have here is in 2.14, Gentiles. So these are people... When Paul is talking here, these are the people that were not the ones under the law. They were not the ones given the law by God. They were just regular folk living in any part of the world. Even they know the truth. Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively 
the things of the law. What do you mean? Well, I'll put it to you this way. How many of you have neighbors that are non-Christian, non, they would probably even say they don't have anything to do with God, they may not even believe with God, but they're kind. Anybody have those? Yeah? Okay. What about people that are right now in the States, we see this huge movement yesterday for uh, women marching for justice because justice is an important thing. How many of you think that every single one of those women are there for justice because that's their um, sense that they're there fulfilling God's role for them? Not necessarily, but they have this ingrained sense of justice. Or there's an ingrained sense of honoring a parent, whether you're taught that or not. We all know, uh, whether you go to church or not, that lying is wrong, right? We all know that, that lying is wrong. And even swearing. I believe that people swear a lot because it catches other people's attention. If you say blah, 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 and you throw in a swear word, people go, oh, because there's something in our spirit that goes, whoa, isn't it? There's something there. So even those that don't follow God, even those that would say there is no God, instinctively, a lot of God's laws are already built in their hearts and in their lives. Isn't that interesting when you think about it like that? Even though they don't have, they can point to a verse and say, oh, this is where this is wrong. They sense, because since they were created in God's image, there's a part of them that goes, hmm. They can't quite shake it. I've shared this before, but according to evolution, there's survival of the fittest, correct? Right? So according to survival of the fittest, we should not be upset when a bully picks on a, a small handicapped child because survival of the fittest says the strongest should survive, right? But who in here would feel comfortable seeing a bully beat up on a handicapped child? And who in our world would feel that way? Oh, yeah, that's natural. That's normal. That's what's supposed to happen. No, there's something inside of us that screams, that's wrong. We instinctively hold to the things of God's law, even if we couldn't put our finger right on it. But the Jews especially, and Paul is talking to a mixed audience here, both people that grew up with the law, the Jews, and those that didn't, the Gentiles, who we just talked about. But the Jews, they knew the law. We see this. You bear the name Jew, and you rely upon the law. This is from, Roman, uh, from Romans 2, verse 17. The law was their guidepost. The law was their community identity. It was their foundation of life. It's how they structured themselves politically, spiritually, even uh, with their armies. They organized themselves around God's word and God's law. But even them... They tweaked it, they reinterpreted it, they added 600 extra laws to it because they thought the law wasn't fulfilling enough the way that it was given to them. And so even the Jews knew their law. So the Gentiles, people that don't uh, know God's law from the Old Testament perspective, they kind of knew the law instinctively, and the Jews had no excuse. They completely knew the law. It was written out before them. So everybody kind of knew what God wanted of them. But then we made a trade. Because the thing was, since we refused to honor God, and we either came up with our own plans, or man-made plans, or man-made laws to supplement God's laws, we made a plan, and we decided to make a trade. Since we refused to honor God, or respect Him, or basically, another word for it is yield to Him, here's what happened. We chose to make a trade, and this is what we traded. We traded. We exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for the image in the form of a corruptible man and birds and four-legged uh, animals and crawling creatures. What are you talking about, Perry? Well, let me put it in a little bit easier language. We chose instead to honor God. We chose to honor heroes. We chose to honor idols. We chose to uh, uh, honor Warriors, kings, athletes, 
presidents, pharaohs. We chose to honor them, these uh, corruptible men. And by the way, all through scripture, we're shown all men are corruptible and women. All corruptible. Right? Even David, the man after God's own heart, fell hard because he was not incorruptible. We all are corruptible. And instead, we too chose to honor all of these folks that we view politically the next savior that will come and change everything and turn everything around or the next music star or whatever the case is. We pour our glory and adoration and our praise into that. I was joking earlier about the Patriots, not that they're not going to win. They are going to win. But, <laughs> but there are going to be more worshipers of the Patriots today than there are in our churches today. That's the truth. They're, they're going to be dressed out, head to toe, Parties everywhere, gathering people over, let's have fun, let's celebrate, listening on every place, screaming at the television at the top of their lungs. Towns are going to break into celebrations or riots, depending upon who wins or loses, because that's who they worship. Whew. We get a little upset if somebody goes, well, I'm going to raise my hand and worship. Oh, <gasps> radical. Seriously? Seriously. Ever been to a professional game? Seriously? Wow. Or, or, not just that, some worship animals. And in this time and culture, people would worship bulls, or they would worship goats, or ravens, or cattle, or snakes, or whatever the case is. Or there would be a mix. If you look at uh, e Egyptology, you'll see that there are like frog man gods, or uh, dog faced gods gods, or whatever the case is, where it's a mix between the creature and the human together, and they'll worship that. Oh, pastor, that sounds weird. Yeah? Have them come and watch us watch a Patriots game, and we'll see who's weird, right? And so why are you so excited? Because if they win, then, then what? How does this impact your life? Then we can say they won. Okay. So you're spending hundreds of dollars blocking off your time, getting plane tickets, hotel tickets, so that, what again? Oh no, but that's not worship. Okay. So, that's what we made a trade. And then also, we made a trade for the lie for the truth. Because rather than believe the truth that causes you to change, you'd rather believe a lie that means you can live the same way. Rather than believe the truth that means you need to make a change, you'd rather believe a lie that means you can live the same way you are right now. Is that true? That's a very common temptation. Well, you know what? If I, if I say that and I believe that, then that means there's an action that's tied to it. No. I'm going to change my beliefs so that I don't have to change my actions. Because it's a whole lot easier to change your mind than it is to change your body and to change what you do. And so many of us choose to, well, we'll just change our mind about that. Right? One of the questions that you're going to see um, for, the, for the groups this week is, if you don't believe a truth is true, does it mean it's not true? If you don't believe 2 plus 2 is 4, does it mean it's not 4? Okay. Well... If you don't believe a truth, it doesn't mean that it's true or not true. I just don't want to believe that. Okay, just don't believe 2 plus 2 is 4. Go through the rest of your life not believing that. And there's some fast food places I could tell you you could work at. God gave us over. God gave us over. Since we made that trade, God said, okay, this is what you want to do? No problem. And so we see that God gave us over. And I'm just going to summarize these because I don't want to take a lot of time, but feel free to look them up later and the notes are in your bulletin. First thing is we see this. God gave us over to sinful desires. He abandoned us to sinful desires. In Romans 1, verse 24, uh, he says, Because they did these things, 
God abandoned them to pursue their sinful desires. And the big thing he focuses on in here is he goes into the sexual impurity and all the different ways that they lived out their lives sexually. Because when a lot of people think of sinful desires, that's the first one they go towards. They think of the bedroom. And, they, and it was, in this case, it was talking about homosexual relationships, but could just as easily be heterosexual relationships outside of uh, marriage. And they just free themselves so they can have these, fulfill these, these sinful desires. Right? That's the first thing. It's like, you want her? Go for it. I'm going to, you know, I'll let you go. The next one was to shameful acts. Uh, verse uh, 26. Because people did these things, God abandoned them to uh, pursue and gave them over to shameful lusts or shameful acts. And he goes on to describe what those acts are. So it's a desire given over to and then acts that they are, are performing and then to worthless thinking. He gave them over to their worthless thinking. Verse 28. People did not think it was important to have a knowledge of a true God, so God abandoned them, gave them over to their worthless thinking uh, to do things that they shouldn't do. You know, no one's going to tell me what to do. Okay, go ahead. In all of these passages, we see a very strong parallel between what God is doing and the story that Jesus tells in Luke 15 of the prodigal son, where the prodigal father says, okay, go. You want to go? Go. And they go. And, they, and the prodigal son goes, and it goes happily ever after. Because he's able to fulfill all of those things that he wants to. And good, I'm free. I'm away from that bondage from my father. And I can go and do all these things. And I can be satisfied. And I can be finally fulfilled and happy. Because that's the lie we believe. Get away from God, and you will find fullness and satisfaction in life. We believe that. Lie. Actually, it takes us to sin in all of its fullness. I'm going to read this. Verse 29. They are filled with every kind of sin and evil, selfishness and hatred. They are full of jealousy, murder, fighting each other. They are gossips. They say evil things about each other. They hate God. They are rude. They are conceited. They brag about themselves. They invent ways of doing evil. Think about that. They invent ways of doing... You know, it's like, I can do all these things, and if I work at it some, I can create some new evil that I can do. Right? I'll just lay out... I, I recognize that we live in a world, and I recognize we live in a community that has a military base right beside it. But the advancement of, of weaponry that is able to kill faster, more efficiently, more um, cleanly and precisely without getting any hands dirty. Wow. Think about that, right? We are really good at creating new forms of, of evil, aren't we? Oh, yeah, but it's for a different reason. It's for a different... I, I understand but I'm just saying that, you know, left to themselves, people went, hmm, internet, pornography, hmm, what can we do with this now? Multi-billion dollar industries, right? It's amazing what evil we can create. They invent new ways of doing evil. They do not keep their promises, and they show nine, no kindness or mercy to others. Uh, they know God's law, what God's law says, and, and those, uh, those that live like this should die. They are actually, one of the other passages says, they disrespect their parents. That is put right in the same uh, category as malicious gossips and murderers and disrespecting parents. And we're like, oh, well, I draw a line there. Really? Really. Because God doesn't. They're all symptomatic of, I'm going to live how I like. So God gave us over. It was um, much like during the Passover when the, the Israelites were saying, oh, I wish we were back in Egypt because then we had meat. You know, we're just stuck in this daily manna, you know, which is the desert equivalent of granola. 
And so that, that's all we have every day. It was fresh food every day, but it was getting so boring. You know, why don't we have meat? Uh, God said, you want meat? I'll give you meat. I'll give you so much meat it comes out your nose. Literally, that's in Scripture. <laughs> and he sends the quail to them. And they have quail. And they eat, they're full of quail. And they keep eating the quail. And if you're in the desert and you've tried to refrigerate meat in the desert, it doesn't go too well. And so they had so much quail and they had so much that they became sick and they were dying from it. But they got what they wanted. Right? One of the great things about falling under God's lordship is he says, okay, here's how much you can handle because you don't know how much you can handle. I am honestly not making anything about this today, but um, I, uh, you've, you've heard about my dog, Jesse. Oh, Jesse died a couple of days ago, unfortunately. I know. So I had her for 12 and a half years. Um, and uh, love her, loved her. Uh, great, great blessing from God. Just thanking God for the time with her. Uh, but one of the things with Jesse, and if you have a dog, dogs don't know when they're full. Did you know that? They will eat and eat and eat. And someone has to say, okay, here's how much you can have today. Right? And if you don't, they'll eat so much they make themselves sick. God knows us. He created us. He loves us. And he knows what we can handle. But unfortunately, we go, I don't want anything from you, God. I don't want to hear what my limits are. God does not desire to hold back anything good from us. All of the desires that you have in your body that God has given you as a gift has been given to you to be experienced in the context of how he has designed you. If, if you are having uh, sexual feelings, then God has designed marriage and commitment for the place for that to be fully explored and, and to be enjoyed between a man and a woman. God has designed those places so that you can fully experience all of the desires he's created in you. He hasn't given you, created you so that you can be dissatisfied all of your life. He has created those things in you so that you can enjoy them in context. But you can't just say, just keep it coming, just keep it coming, just keep it coming, because we were not created to handle those things. He even told us to take a Sabbath day to rest so that we won't burn out. That's his care for us. God is setting boundaries for us through his law to say, here's how you can fully enjoy life. Because if I don't tell you, you're just going to go and ruin yourself. And in this passage from um, verses 29 to 31, if you read that over and you say, boy, I'd love to live in that society <laughs> where everybody's looking to murder, conceit, brag about one another, uh, uh, backstab one another, this is just ripping a community apart if everybody lives like this then yes, they should die if that's the way they're going to live because if not, they're going to bring destruction on everyone that they're around. They're going to be fodder for the next army that comes in to try and take over the land. They're going to self-destruct. And so we go, and that's how what we were abandoned to. And so basically he gave us what we wanted. And so you're going to, when you're, when you're talking with people that don't follow God and don't, and, and don't know faith and don't know the gospel, they're going to be saying, hey, we're living the life, right? Because they are living out all those things. But the truth is in every single one of them, just like the prodigal son, you will find a time when uh, the lust ain't lust anymore. And the shameful acts aren't really satisfying anymore. And your thinking doesn't help you anymore or move you forward anymore. And all of those sins has left you isolated and alone and abandoned. And there you are. Now, the verdict... Verses 132 says this, and those that practice such things, and we can understand that, that complete lawlessness, that complete utter chaos, people that live like that are worthy of death. And not only do they do the same, but they also give hearty approval to those who practice with them. That's the other thing that's really bad. It's one thing to say that, you know, you're going to live a way that is just totally self-destructive. But when you're encouraging others... When you're, when you're encouraging others, 
when there is an alcoholic that's screaming to a, a college-age kid, chug, 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 chug. When there's a, when there's a, an, an addict that's trying to push her addiction on someone else. And there's a gossip that's trying to get other people gossiping. Right? When those things happen and they start to spiral, it's one thing for it to just impact you, but when you're encouraging that for others, and as a society, as you encourage it for others, wow, you, you, can you understand how we can end up in a lot of trouble? Very fast. And then we see this, that God himself is the judge. We know that judgment of God richly falls upon those who practice such things. You see, here's the thing. If everybody's doing all these terrible things, who can judge? Because there's no one that doesn't do at least one or two or three or four of these things. Only God can judge because the rest of us are practitioners. If you think of yourself in a military, uh, not in a military, but in a courthouse, and there is a judge behind uh, whatever the judge sits behind, we'll say a desk, there's probably a fancy word for it, but the judge is there, and there's someone that's in the fence box, and there's being accused, the truth is, is that none of us can be their accuser, because after they're done, we have to go take their seat because we are going to be the next one that's going to be accused. Self-righteousness, here's a definition that I heard this week from Hugh Halter. Self-righteousness, the definition is when we think our sins aren't as bad as others. That's the definition of self-righteousness. When we think our sins, our, my Fundy Coast accent came out, our, our sins are not as great as those of others then we can judge. And that's what makes us self-righteous. Oh, well, their sins are this. I only do this little thing, and I only do this because of da-da-da-da-da. Congratulations, you are now self-righteous. You may kiss yourself. <laughs> that is the nature of self-righteousness. Right? Oh, yeah, they do all these terrible things, but, you know, my things aren't that bad or my things are small, or in comparison, yeah? Truth is, broken is broken. Broken relationship. If you are sinning, that means you do not want to be in relationship with God. You want your own way. And it's just a matter of how much you want your own way is the level of how bad this or that is. But that doesn't mean that you have the right to judge. Only God can judge. When we think our sins aren't as bad as others, and we can't be the accuser, because we are the next defendants. So, painting this lovely picture, as I've said, it's a pretty black background. I do want to show you this, what we needed. Even though we got what we wanted, what did we need, and we weren't even aware of? We see this in 2.4. This is our key verse for this uh, passage of chapters 1 and 2. Do you think lightly of the riches and kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? You see, in the midst of this all, in the midst of us being lost, in the midst of us being abandoned, in the midst of us getting exactly what we want, and that's what it is. It's not a punishment. It's getting what we want, and getting what we want may deserve punishment. But remember first, it's not God saying, I'm going to get you. God's going to say, whoa, I'm just going to let you do what you want to do. You want to do that? I'm just hands off, right? That's not an evil God, right? I don't know if any of you have ever had to have influence over someone else, either a student or a child or whatever. At some point when you get someone that's stubborn, it's like, okay, fine. <laughs> okay. I warned you. You, you, you. you go for it, right? And then they find out. And that's what God did. That's not an evil God that did that. He's like, okay, you want it? I'll let you have it. You go for it. Fill your boots. And we ended up in a horrible state. But even though we were in a horrible state, and even though the prodigal father let the prodigal son go, here's what we see. The prodigal father's waiting. 
waiting for the Son to return. And God, in this passage, do you think lightly of the riches and kindness and tolerance and patience of God? Right? In the midst of all the wickedness that y'all are doing, do you forget how kind and tolerant and patient God is? God has not got his eyes closed to you and off to the back and I don't want to see you. He's there waiting. And know this, that the kindness of God leads you to repentance. By God being kind, by God not coming in and forcing that judgment down every single time you do something, by God not forcing that on you, he is giving the kindness of him and giving you time to come around. Right? His kindness leads to repentance. I don't know if you've ever had to uh, take a horse to water and try and make it drink. That's a wonderful expression. Right? You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Rather than God trying to shove our necks into the water, he's there waiting. I say, when you're thirsty, water's here. When you're thirsty, water's here. And it's here. And if you want to be stubborn and you don't want to ever drink water, okay. But water's here. Jesus told the woman at the well, I can give you water that lasts forever. Springs of living water that you will not need anymore. She didn't quite get it. We fully don't get it. But God offers us through his kindness, his patience, and his tolerance, he offers us a way. And we're going to see next week how that begins to build, okay? So like I said, this morning is not the most yay, but it is so important that we recognize the dark canvas upon which the gospel is being painted. So even if this is your first and only Sunday here, please look at the website in the future weeks to see where the rest of the story goes because it's like um, stopping gone with the wind after chapter one. There's more to it. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your patience, for your kindness, for your tolerance, for your goodness. Thank you, God, that although you abandoned us to our desires and our acts and our thinking, you didn't abandon us completely. You're there, still there watching us. You're still there reaching out to us. You're still there offering to us. And we pray, Lord, that today if we find ourselves more like um, what we read of the people in the early chapters of Romans, we pray, Lord, now that you would take our hearts and transform them. Lord, that we repent of those things that we know are not leading us into a better life, but are dragging us down and are ruining not only ourselves, but our family and our friends and our, our co-workers. Father God, Thank you that we do not have to stay in that condition. And that though you are a God that is fair and worthy to, to judge, you choose to offer from your seat mercy. So Lord, we ask for that today. And we pray if someone today is feeling that in their heart, you know who they are. And I pray, Lord, that you and them do business today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you stand as we close with broken vessels and amazing grace?